say not. There is nothing that you cannot do. So, Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor and we thank you in advance and ahead of time that, you are, that which you are prepared to do with us and for us and through us in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. And the people of God says amen. amen. Hallelujah. May you be seated in the presence of the Lord. First of all, I apologize for being extremely late. This morning I missed um, the worship, so I asked Mike, I was like, how is the worship? And then Mike said, the worship is very good. Michael leads it, and he does a, a good job. So I was like, you know what? If Michael does a good job, then I'm just going to stay behind and have him. <laughs> that's actually not what happened, but that's my excuse. <laughs> Hallelujah. So um, tonight, it's going to be a great night. I've been praying for you. I spent some time this afternoon seeking the Lord. And then I, I believe that. This week is ordained by God. Amen. And I want, to, I want to encourage you that don't miss a service. First of all, every service is different. I told you this morning, we, were just come, we are just coming out from Jemison, PA. We finished Wednesday. The meeting could have been extended, but we needed to come here. You know, there was more people in the service on Wednesday night than there were Sunday morning. And you know, in every church, Sunday morning is their biggest crowd. Sunday morning is when those that don't want to go to church come to church. You know, because Sunday morning is like, oh God, you know, I was there. Just show up. But Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and on down line is where the real Christians come to church. Um, one preacher said that if you want to know how big your church is, call a prayer meeting. Because those that come to the prayer meeting are your real members. Those are the ones that you, you can count on. Those are the ones that serve in the church. And those are the ones that you can, you know, you can build the kingdom of God with. So I want to commend you for, you could do anything. You, know, you are right outside of Chicago. I visited Chicago about two, three months ago. And it, man, what a beautiful city that the devil is trying so hard to destroy. But I believe that God is not done with Illinois. God is not done with America. God is not done with your family. I believe that your greatest days are not behind you, but your greatest days are ahead of you. I believe that we are going to see the greatest move of God than we've ever seen, and I believe that you're going to encounter God in a profound way than you've ever done. I believe that you're going to have a testimony, and you're going to say that indeed God is a good God, and people are going to look at you and say, look what his or her God has done for him or her. Amen. So, um, I, am, I am an evangelist. If you don't know what an evangelist is, first of all, I don't even know what an evangelist is. I'm still discovering. <laughs> Amen. But God called me as an evangelist. And I'm, usually when I go to churches, I take a few moments because if people don't know who you are, they look at you like you have ten heads. But I, I'm a very good looking young man. You know, I smell good. I dress good. I look good. So... <laughs> Hallelujah. When you talk like this, people are like, man, this guy is so full of himself. Well, you know what's funny? I don't really care what anybody thinks of me. <laughs> the Bible said that I am a royal priesthood. I am a peculiar person. You know what peculiar means? It means that you are one of a kind. Your specimen cannot be found anywhere else. So I'm one of a kind. <laughs> We're going to have a great time, amen. amen. No matter what your issue of concern is, there is nothing that God cannot do. I want you to remember this. And I want you to have an expectation this week that you're going to have an encounter with the Lord and God is going to wipe away every tears from your eyes. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he says that when I came to you, my message was not with men's wisdom of, or not with persuasive words of men's wisdom. But I came with a demonstration of the spirits and power. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that for I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for it alone. You have to understand, you know, we travel all over the place. We do mass crusades in Africa and I'm actually getting ready to do another mass crusade. In, in June, and then another one in August, 
June in Ghana, August in Tanzania. And we, you know, we, we, we're doing this all over the place. And we have seen countless proof of God's power manifest in, in places. We have seen, we have, you know, the Bible says, attest and see that the Lord is good. I have tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good. There is no doubt in my heart about any word in God's word. I believe that God is more than able to do exceedingly abundantly, more than he has said or more than you can think or even imagine. God is able to do more than your wildest dream or your wildest expectation. There is nothing you are going through that God can't change. There is nothing you are facing that God can't change it. There is nothing that the devil has done to you that God cannot undo. Somebody say amen. amen. So usually when we travel to places, I would have to like let people know who I am, what I do. But my wife made a video, and I'm going to play that video, and that video basically shows you who I am and what I do. Do you guys have a video? No. They didn't give you any video. Uh, whatever. It's my wife's fault. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, since she didn't give you any video, I'm just going to go ahead and preach. And then, when we get a video, I'm going to play the video. But the video basically is an introduc introduction to our ministry. It just shows where, what we do. And we've seen, man, I've seen the power of God. In a pro I, I just told you this morning, there may be who came into a meeting, never been to a Pentecostal service before, never been to a church like this. And the power of God went through her. And she, had, she pulled off her oxygen. You know, God healed her instantly. And I believe that we, you know, if you've never seen the healing power of God ever, you're going to see some this week in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So I want you to have an expectation. Set your faith that God is going to do something tangible. Not just... Even, not just even in the realms of your healing, but even in the realms of your finances, whatever. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. And God is not limited to one way, oh, God can heal you of the flu, but God can heal you of, the, um, of any other thing. God can heal you of cancer, but when it comes to COVID, you got to use wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it really, God can do all things. Amen. And the Bible says you also can do all things. Through Christ who gives you strength. Yeah. And this week, the strength of God shall be infused into your body. Yeah. And your life will never be the same. I promise you that. Yeah. Make it a point to sit under God's word. The Bible said in Acts chapter 19 verse 20 that so mightily Paul went to a place. And the Bible said that so mightily grew the word of God. Phoebe. Come on. You know, I'm her best friend. Did you tell them that I'm your best friend? They should know. They should know. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bible says that so mightily grew the word of God and it prevails. Yeah. If you allow or you give yourself to the word of God and allow the word of God to grow in you, it will prevail over every issue of concern. Over every issue of concern. Just give time to the word of God because the Bible says that the word of God is a seed. And when the seed is planted, the seed dies and then the seed begins to grow and then the seed bears forth fruit. Tonight, I want to preach a message. I was just driving here last night. I was talking to my wife. I'm going to preach a lot of messages that I've never preached before. Which, because as we're driving here, the Lord was dealing with me about many, many things. And tomorrow, I'm going to take some time, again, like I did this afternoon in prayer. Tomorrow, I'm going to take some time. Let me tell you this. This is a very special church. And when I came here this morning, I felt in my spirit to really take some time and pray for this meeting and pray for this church. Most of the time when I travel to preach, even for crusades, what I do is that I pray before I come. And when I come, I just relax and allow God to do. Because we can get into the tendency of like trying to make things happen. But then when, you know, the, I, hate, uh, I hate those terms and those jargons they use. Churches let go and let God. But then, let me use it here. So like in the meetings, I just let go and let God. So that I, you can't glory in saying that, oh, God did this because of my prayer. God did it because sometimes, most of the time we put more emphasis on our faith, our spirituality over what God said he is and who, what God can do. Amen. But this week I just feel very, very strong and impressed in my spirit to take some time and pray. So 
I'm going to be praying for this church. I'm going to be praying for these meetings. And I know that we're going to see unusual things happen in our lives. And we're going to see God do great things in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to preach a message today that I have entitled, Why Do Bad Things Happen? And you can ask Mike and Sarah, I never title my messages. Because most of the time when I grab a mic, I don't even know what I'm preaching. I just begin to speak and then the Lord takes it whatever direction. Where you, but I just felt impressed to preach about this. Why do bad things happen? Because if you understand the roots of why things happen, you would understand the necessity to have faith and to develop your faith in the things of God. And everything will make sense. Because most of the time, the deception of the enemy is to make you blame God for the works of the enemy. Because even believers don't know what the devil is doing and don't know what God is doing. So sometimes when something bad happens to an individual, they think that it is the doing of the almighty God. So then you hear people say this, that God, the video is ready? Okay, one moment. You hear people say this, that God made me sick so that he would use me to minister to my nurse. But the Bible says that know this, that God cannot tempt with evil. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Everything is, it is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That any good thing comes from the Lord. There is nothing good that comes from the devil. And every bad thing comes from the devil. There is nothing bad that comes from God. In your Christian work, if you can understand this basic principle, it will take you very, very far. And it will put a spirit and energy in you to resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Somebody say amen. You have to understand this. Whatever is bad is from the devil. Whatever is good comes from God. So then you, don't, you do not credit the bad things that happen in your life to the devil. You know, the Bible says that whatever, what did Joshua say? Um, Joseph. Joseph said that you meant evil for me, but God turned it around for my good. So yes, God can turn wicked situations and evil situations and flip it around for your good. But it doesn't mean that God was the author and the orchestrator of that evil. Amen. You know, the Bible said that all things work together for good. So as long as you are in Christ and you are rooted up in Christ, it doesn't matter what the enemy thinks. It doesn't matter what the enemy has planned for you. Though he might meant for your bad, my God shall turn it around for your good in Jesus' name. If you believe it, clap your hands and give praise to the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. So why do bad things happen? I want you to understand there is three main reasons, foundational reasons why bad things happen. There is three main reasons. And every reason comes from one of these issues. Number one, I want you to understand, and I don't know um, why this is like very difficult, but there is different kinds of Christians. Now, number one Christian that blames everything on the devil. You know, they they, they just were lazy, so they got fired from work. The devil made me lose my job. No, the devil didn't make you lose your job. You were lazy, so your boss got rid of you. You know, they, they do things that, because life, life, as you see, it is cause and effect. There is input and output to life. That is just the principle of life. Whatever you put in is what you can put out. You know, you have to understand that. So you can't show laziness and reap the reward of hard work. So when you do things that brings a repercussion to your life, you can never blame it on the devil. So there is people that just blame everything on the devil. You know, I was in Bible school, and one young man and one young girl got involved in sexual immorality. You know, they were sleeping together, and they were, they were caught. And their excuse was like, God made me do it. You know, to that, so there are people that are very, very stupid and very dumb. You get what I'm saying? Very, very, like, you, you, you would wonder what kind of brains they have. You know, how can, yeah, God told me, shoot, all kinds of mess. So there are people, that's the kind of, there is human beings like that, that, they do not take responsibility for their life. 
they blame everything that happens in their life to um, an ethereal force or a superficial force or to the devil or to God. But there is a second class of Christians who also ignore the reality of the devil. You know, they do not give any account. They, they don't recognize the, you know, the activities of the devil in your life. But Paul said that for we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy, lest he gains an advantage of us. When you do not know that there is a devil and the devil is after your life and the devil wants to kill, to steal and destroy your life. You know, when you live in ignorance, you just become a victim of the devil. You, you know, you just become a free reign for the devil. Because you have to know that in this world, life is truly and indeed spiritual. Life is not just as you see it. The Bible says that we know that the, the world as we see it was made from things that are not seen. So there is a devil, and the devil hates your life. The devil wants to kill you. The devil wants to destroy you. If it's not for the devil alone, your life will end up in a divorce. Your children will be sick. Your children will die. You will lose your job. You will lose everything. That cause. If it's not for the devil alone, you would cry and say, where is my God? You have to understand. So there is a, there is a real devil. The devil hates you. You, you know, when you know your enemy, you know how to maneuver around him. If a man has, in your neighborhood, has made it very clear that I hate you and I want to take your life away from you, you would learn how to maneuver around the man. First of all, you would go to the cops and say that this man has said threats against me. He has said he wants to kill my life. So if anything happens to me, go and, you know, ask him questions. Because you know that he has, he has declared you as an enemy of, 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 and as enemy of your soul. And many believers are playing around with the devil. Though the enemy has declared a war against your soul and against your salvation. So, you know, because when you, you look at somebody indulging in sin, indulging in, in, in the, like playing on the devil's turf, playing on the devil's playground, you wonder. Do they even know what if the devil has his way, what they would do to you? So there is a devil. There is a reason why the devil hates you. You have to understand the reason why the devil hates you. The Bible talks about it in Ezekiel chapter 27. The Bible talks about the glory of the devil. That how Satan was covered in many stones. The Bible says that he was, the, he was he, all precious stones was his covering. You know, Satan who was formerly called, before he became Satan, he was called Lucifer. And the Bible says that he dwelt in heaven. You know, in heaven there is three kinds of angels, three categories of angels. There is the archangel Michael, who is in charge of warfare. Every time that the angel of God needed to go to war, it was archangel Michael that was deployed together with the angels that followed him. And there, was, there is the category number two, which is the archangel Gabriel who is in charge of messages. He delivered every time, look to the Bible, every time an angel appeared to any man to deliver a message from heaven, it was Gabriel that delivered the message. And there was another archangel called Lucifer, who was in charge of worship in heaven. And the Bible says, you know, just imagine when you read, and I'm, you know, I don't want to preach long tonight, because if I read it all, I'm not going to be able to finish my message. But, the Bible talks about his beauty. He was, be he was beautiful to behold. The Bible said that, you know, when he spoke, it sounded like all the instruments playing at once. He was, he was made of musical instruments. He was the only angel that the Bible described his, his magnificence. He was magnificent to behold. That is why they want to deceive you and let you know, you know, with all those that they, may, they want you to think that the devil has two horns and a long tail and he, he's red. No, the Bible talks about who he is. The Bible says that he was perfect. You know, when they, they tell you that you can't be perfect, tell them no. God makes perfect things, amen. So the Bible talks about Lucifer. Lucifer. 
this glorious creation of the Almighty God. And then the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, the verse number 12 going, the Bible says that iniquity was found in him because Satan said that I would exalt myself like the Most High God. So the Bible said that at that moment, pride entered into him and he was rejected from heaven. Jesus said that I saw Satan fall like a lightning. So at that moment, because of pride, he, heaven could no longer contain him. So angel Gabriel, angel Michael went and kicked. It wasn't God that kicked Satan out of heaven. It was archangel Michael that kicked Satan out of heaven. And the Bible says that he took one third of the host of angels. Remember this, I told you that there's three categories of angels. So he took all the angels that were under his jurisdiction. All the angels that were under him. So which means that now heaven is vacant of worshipers. Hallelujah. You know, you understand what I'm saying? He heaven is vacant of worshipers. So all Satan did was that he wanted to be like God. That was his offense. That was his crime. I want to be like God. And God said, you know, Michael said, you can never be like God. Matter of fact, because you want to be like God, we can no longer allow you to dwell here with us. And then he came from, the Bible says that how Lucifer, how, how thou have the mighty fallen, fell from heaven. They casted him out. He became a sin. He became a curse. He was no longer allowed in the company of the holy ones. Now he has become a curse. And now there's been a time that has been appointed for his total destruction. There is a hell that has created to swallow him up. But all he said in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, he says that I want to be like the most high. And heaven could not allow him to be like the most high. And then, you know, so but it baffled my mind. God wanted to replace the devil because now two-thirds of the angels that remained, one-third is gone. And the one-third was in charge of worshiping God. So God wanted to replace that one-third. To replace him, God said, let us go down and make man. But what baffled my mind in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 is that God said that let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Yeah. So the devil wanted to be in the image and the likeness of God. God said, no, you can't be. But then God came down, looked at Phoebe and said, I'm going to make Phoebe like me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So you have to understand that what the devil wanted to be and couldn't be, God has made you. So you are the better replacement of Lucifer. So he looked at it and said, no, this cannot be. God, I've been with you all this while. I've served you all this while. I wanted to be like you. You said I couldn't be like you. And you went and made these people like you to replace me. And not only have you made them like you, you've given them free will. You've given them dominion. You've given them power and authority over me. So then the devil has set up his mind that God has replaced you with him. Not only has God replaced you with him, God has made you the apple of his eyes. You know, David said, God, what is man that you are so mindful of? God, David looked at him and said, I am wonderfully and fearfully made. I am made by the hand of the almighty God. Listen, God has given me dominion over all the things of the earth. Listen, God has made me to be like him. Somebody asked me, a question one day, he says, how does God look like? He said, you, want to, you really want an answer? He said, yes. How does God look like? I said, are you ready for me to show you how God looks like? He said, yes. I said, I don't think you are ready to know how God looks like. He said, I said, I am ready to know how God looks like. I said, if you were ready, you would already know how God looks like. He said, no, I want you to show me how God looks like. I said, look at me, because I am made in the image and in the likeness of God. If you want to see how God looks like, stand in the mirror, because you have been made like God. You talk like God. You think like God. You are in the image of the Almighty God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, the devil hates you. Because you are the better replacement of him. You are the better replacement of him. So the devil has made everything he could to destroy your life. Just imagine 
if you ever had a girlfriend or you had a boyfriend, let me put it this way. You had a boyfriend, because the ladies would understand it better. You had a boyfriend who cheated on you. And then your boyfriend lives in an apartment. And, you know, your boyfriend knows that you just got, or you had a husband that cheated on you. And your husband knows that you just got approved for the Illinois Conceal to conceal Carry. <laughs> and they know that you are not afraid to use it because they heard you preaching at church on Sunday and you made threats from the pulpit. I'm not talking about you, Pastor Kathy. <laughs> you know, and then they know that you don't, you know, you don't mind doing things. So your, boy, your husband or your boyfriend goes and get a restraining order against you. And then tells the apartment that don't let that woman come into this apartment anymore. Yes, there is a restraining order against you. You get there, you got there to the apartment, and the person, the security, says that no, you're not allowed to go upstairs. So you are standing, looking at him through the window, giving him the middle finger, you know, saying, screaming, yelling, I'm going to cut off your head, I'm going to beat you, I'm going to do that. But you can't get to him because he's so high. He is in the apartment, he's secure, he's protected, he's been kept away from you. But then, when I was driving in, I saw a very nice red Mustang parked out. So I, was, I like Mustangs, you know. And then, your boyfriend or your husband has a very nice red Mustang. And you see it parked on the side of the road. And you know that this guy loves his car so much, he gets down to clean the car three times a day. Now you can't get to him. But then you turn around and you see the Mustang. What are you going to do as a good woman? <laughs> See, Pastor Kathy said, you, want to, you would want to hurt him. You would want to do something to him where it hurts most. You would want to take a stone, take a baseball bat, take a swing into the car a couple times, break mirrors, do key the car, whatever you want to do to make him want to come downstairs when he sees you do it, you're going to do it. So, you see, the devil can't, rebel, can't retaliate against God for God, what God has done to him because of his rebellion. But what the devil can do is that he can hurt God where it hurts most. Because the Bible said that you are the apple of God's eye. So the devil wants to poke God's eye by inflicting you with diseases, by causing pain into your life, by causing you to live without being in poverty, struggle, go through divorce, lose a child, be, you know, all kinds of things. Whatever he can do to hurt God because he knows how much God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God gave his son to come and die for your sake. So the devil is working over time to destroy you. That's why the Bible says that it is the thief that came to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I came here with a good news. The Bible says that for this reason that the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the enemy. That is why God sent me here all the way from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Rockford, Illinois. I came to put an end to every affliction of hell. I came to put an end to every abuse of hell that has come up against your life, that has come up against your family. I came to declare that enough is enough. The devil should take a sense of your health, take a sense of your finances in a mighty name of Jesus. Whatever the devil has done against you, this week it comes to an end in the name of Jesus. If you believe it, shout amen and give God praise. So bad things happen because there is a devil that hates your life. Bad things happen because there is a devil that hates your life. The devil hates you. But I, you know, you have to understand that regardless of the hatred of the enemy, the enemy is a non-factor. Because Jesus, the Bible says that when Jesus died, he descended into hell. And he stripped, the Bible said in um, Colossians, that he made a public show of the devil triumphing over him. So as a believer, Jesus has stripped the devil of all his powers and his abilities to harm you. The only power that the devil has. That is what the Bible said. It is the 
the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. So the power he has is to deceive you into, into um, succumbing your will under his, his tactics to make you think that you are not good enough, to make you think that you have no power over him, to make you think that you have no direction over him. But Jesus said that I give you power to trample over scorpions and serpents, and nothing shall by any means harm you. I came to declare that you have more power in your pinky than all the hosts and all the, the, the hosts of hell. You have more power than Satan himself. And in the name of Jesus, before this week comes, you shall discover the power of God, and you will begin to exercise the power of God that lies on the inside of you. Listen, the devil might have had the first love, but I came to declare that you shall have the last love in in the mighty name of Jesus, the devil has lost you for good. The worst thing the devil could have done was to allow you to come into tonight's service. The devil has lost the battle over your health. He has lost the battle over your finances. He has lost the battle over your family. He has lost the battle over Illinois in the mighty name of Jesus. This city, this nation, this state does not belong to the devil. Your children does not belong to the devil. Your family does not belong to the devil. You do not belong to the devil in the mighty in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout enough is enough. Shout enough is enough. The devil will not have the last laugh. He will not have the last laugh. You will laugh best in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Ephesians. If you don't know where Ephesians is, I'm, I'm also trying to find it. If you are there, say I'm there. If you are not there, say wait for me. Now we know, we know those that are slow. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says that even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Jesus. So, you have been raised far above the devil. You are seated where Christ is. So for the devil to get to you, he has to come to where Jesus is. Amen. You know, you have to understand that the Bible says that God has put the devil under our feet. So if you are looking for the devil, you have to look underneath your feet for the devil. And if the devil wants to act up, just put your feet real hard on the ground and say, hey, devil, I'm squeezing you and you can't do anything about it. Because the Bible says that you shall crush the herd of the serpent in the name of Jesus. Every devil that has come against you, I crush his head in Jesus' name. So you are seated far above. So, yes, we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. But, yes, we also know the power that we have against the devil. The Bible says that for greater is he that lives on the inside of me than they that are of the world. For by my God I can run through a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. For yea, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I shall fear no evil. It doesn't matter what the devil does. It doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter what is going on around me. As when all men say that there is a casting down, I shall say that there is a lifting up. Because I know that the devil can't stop me. The devil can't do anything about my life. The devil can't do anything about my health. The devil can't do anything about my finances. The devil has no power. He has no jurisdiction over my life life, the devil can stop the growth of this church. The devil can stop your advancement in the mighty name of Jesus because God is the lifter of my head and if God has blessed me, then no one can curse. Whatever drug God has opened unto me, no one can shut. And I came with an anointing on my head. I came to declare over your life in the mighty name of Jesus you are blessed and you can be cursed. You are unstoppable in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So though there is a devil, there is the power of the almighty God. And the devil's power can't stop the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, one Holy Ghost-filled believer can destroy an entire army of the devil. All you have to do is to say in the name of Jesus, come out. Because he says that I give you power to trample over all scorpions and serpents. And nothing shall by any means harm you. Joseph's family 
sold them into slavery because of the jealousy that came in them. Because they saw that this man had such a glorious destiny. They couldn't do anything to stop the fulfillment of God's destiny. So they said, you know what, let us do something about it. Let us make sure that he never see the fulfillment of his dream. But little did they know that what they meant for evil, God meant it for good. Listen, no matter what you have, you have been going through, no matter what you have been dealing with, God shall turn it around for your good in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me tell you this. This troubles, this pain, this affliction, it's not going to end your destruction, but it's going to reveal the glory of God into all generations. The Bible said that you have been called forth to show forth the praise of the Almighty God. The praise of God shall come out of your mouth. The praise of God shall come out of your life. Listen, people will look at you. People will see your testimony and they shall give glory to the Lord. The Bible says that when God turned around their captivity, for they were like they that dreamt, for their mouth was filled with laughter. They hid in saw and said that look what their God has done for them. People will rejoice and praise God because of your life. For whatever the enemy does, it shall turn together for your good in the name of Jesus. For the devil can stop whom God has blessed. If God said that you are blessed, there is nothing the enemy can do about it. There is nothing Satan can do about it. Listen, they can come up against you. By my God, you can run through a troop. By my God, you shall leap over a wall. It doesn't matter any resistance. They can build the Red Sea, but you shall stretch forth your rod, and you shall walk through the sea on dry land. I came to declare unto you that you shall go from glory to glory, from victory to victory, and from strength to strength. Where you are today is the lowest you shall ever be. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the devil can't stop you. Yes, there is a devil. Yes, he hates you. Yes, he wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. If it was left for the devil alone, you would have no baby formula. I mean, I mean if it was left for Joe Biden alone, synonymous with the devil. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> you know, you have to understand. Even with everything, with everything that is going on in the world, it is the plan of the devil to cause the children of God to suffer and to be in pain. But the word of the Lord said that even in famine you shall eat in plenty. So there is nothing. The Bible says that who is he who has spoken and it shall come to pass that which God has not declared. You know, Pastor Kathy said here this morning that Kofi prays Old Testament. I don't Old Testament. I don't pray Old Testament prayers. I believe the Bible. That's what it is. Because you have to understand that the God said in, the, in the Hebrew chapter four that come boldly before the throne of grace. If you believe the word of God, then you will know how to handle the word of God. Because if anyone has made themselves an enemy of the church, listen, I love whom God loves and I hate who God hates. That's it. David looked at Goliath and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? When everybody was talking about how tall, how big his sword was, how big his shield was. David refused to recognize him because at that moment, Goliath has made himself the enemy of God. It didn't matter how big he was. It didn't matter how tall he was. All he knew that if you lift up your hands against God, then I'm going to cut off thy hands in the name of Jesus. Anyone that has made himself an enemy of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare an end. I declare let their finances dry up. Let their influences become foolishness. Let everything they touch turn into dust. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, though there is an enemy, there is the power of the Holy Ghost. For the Bible says that greater is he who lives in me. My Lord, do the greater is he who lives in me. The greater one lives on the inside of me. I am not concerned with what is out there. I am not afraid of the devil's tactics. I am not afraid of the devil's tricks. Though an enemy may come against me one way, but it shall flee from me seven different ways. I am too loaded. I am too anointed. I am too powerful. The word of God lies on the inside of my belly like fire. I can't shut it up. I can't contain it. Listen, listen. God is on my side. 
there is nothing that the devil can do to take me out. If God be for me, what then can stand up against me? The enemy can roar. <laughs> the enemy can talk. The Bible said, who is he? That talks and it comes to pass. What power, what audacity, what authority, what rights does he have to speak concerning my life? What right does he have to determine the outcome of my destiny? My life is not in my own hands. Paul said that the life that I live is no longer how that I live it. But Christ lives in me. For me to live, to live is in Christ. And to die is gain. Listen, for the devil to touch me, he has to go through Christ. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, there is a devil. But there is an end to the devil's power. Jesus said, I give you power. As a believer... You know, I always say this, that a church is like a sleeping giant. But, you know, when the church fully awakes, when the church really fully recognizes the power of God that lies on the inside of them, when the church fully recognizes who they are, there is, the devil would have to dig a, some, dig a hole in the ground and stick his head in. Because when the church rises up, there is no power. There is no power, there is no government in Illinois that can withstand the power of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this. This church here in Rockford has, no, has more power to, to determine and detect the happiness of Illinois than the, um, what is, the left foot or right foot has. Uh, I don't know her name. Is it right foot or left foot? White foot? Life foot, okay. She looks like a life foot. <laughs> or whatever foot. She just looks like a foot, period. You know, the church, you, 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 I'm talking, and you have to understand the church is not a building. The Bible says that we are the living stones. Because without you, the building is just a building. And it's not the building that makes a church, it is the people that makes a church. So I'm talk, when I talk about a church, I'm talking about you. You sitting here have, have more power on the inside of you than middle foot, um, life foot has. When you decide to take matters into your whole hands and begin to declare from your mouth, you would realize that you would have more influence in this city by the power of the Holy Ghost than any governor and any political leader. Hallelujah. So the devil can bark, the devil can do. All the devil knows how to do is to talk. When you look through the scriptures, the devil has been a noise maker. He is braggadocious. He is like a toothless dog. He comes and barks, and his bark is loud and fierce and scary. But when you get close to him, you realize that he has no teeth to bite. So when people do not recognize, when people are ignorant of the devices of the enemy, the moment they hear the bark, they go run. They, you know, go look for help. They begin to cry. Oh, woe is me. But you have to recognize that the devil is already defeated. The devil is under your feet. The devil lives at your mercy. You can determine what happens to the devil. Man, have you ever seen a, a demon possessed or somebody with a devil being delivered before? Look at how pathetic the devil looks. You know, the Bible actually says in Isaiah chapter 14. Let me read it and then I'm... I said I'm not going to preach long, but the way things is looking, you guys might have to test somebody to bring you dinner. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's look at, look at this with me, Isaiah chapter 14. Man, I, I'm, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right here. Isaiah chapter 14, the verse number, let me read from the verse number 12, as I started already. He says that how... You are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I would be like the most high. So that was what the devil said. And then he was kicked out of heaven. You know, the Bible says that pride comes before the fall. 
So if you want to see, if you see any prideful man, you can, you can know their end. Anyone that exhorts himself, anyone that thinks highly of themselves than they ought to, you can know their end. Their end, they have already predetermined their end. And if you know a man that humbles himself, I'm not, I'm not talking about being timid, because, you know, in this generation, we, we are mistaking timidity for humility. And then we're mistaking confidence for pride. Even though both has a very thin line. But just because one is confident in the word and boasts in God doesn't make them prideful. Listen, my confidence, I've never healed a fly before. I don't even think I have the anointing or the power to heal anybody. But my confidence is in the fact that God's word has the power to heal. The Holy Ghost is a healer. That is what my confidence is in. You know, I don't have any power to withstand any forces. I don't have any power to stand in my own strength, to stand before the devil. But I know that God lives on the inside of me. And if God be for me, then what then can stand up against me? For greater is he who lives in me than they that are of the world. So, when, so there is a very, very thin line. There is a very fine line between that. But when you exalt yourself, above, when you, you allow pride to come into your heart, then you know that destruction awaits for you. Amen. So that is what the Bible says. You have to submit yourself, therefore, under God. Let me tell you this. When you submit yourself under God, don't worry about pride. Because if you really genuinely submit yourself under God, God will always have a way to humble you. I'm telling you, <laughs> God, will always help, God will help you stay on track. Amen. So he said... That I would ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to show to the lowest depth of the pit, the, the, um, the lowest depth of the pit. Those who see you would gaze at you and consider you sin. Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its city, who did not open the house of his prisoners, his, his prisoners? All the kings of the nation and all of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like a garment of those who are slain. So the Bible said, if you see the devil for who he is, you would say that is this he? This is the one that I was afraid of? This is the one that I couldn't sleep at night? This is the one that I thought wanted to, you know, had all the power to destroy me. If you see Satan for who he is, you will lose all kinds of respect for him. Because the Bible said that he has been cast out like an abominable branch. The devil looks very pathetic. Let me tell you this, the devil doesn't look scary. If, do you know why Satan doesn't manifest himself to people? Do you think if the devil... It's as bad as they make it seem in Hollywood movies. And do you think that if the devil wants to destroy Christians' lives, he would be appearing to people so that people would be so afraid, and then, because the devil's power is in fear, and I'm going to get there, but he would be appearing to people for people to be afraid. The reason why Satan doesn't manifest to people is because when you see him, you will lose all kinds of respect for him. Matter of fact, you would even feel sorry for him. You know, I was watching a video, and um, I was watching a video on Instagram, or maybe TikTok, whatever. If don't judge, I know there's a lot of older people, they don't even know what TikTok is. But if you know, don't judge me. But I was watching a video on TikTok, and there was this guy who was in prison <coughs> getting ready to be killed. You know, he was on death row. So he was eating his last meal. Have you seen the video? Oh, he was eating his last meal. And you could tell the fear, like he couldn't like eat because he was facing death. This is the meal he's going to eat. And then after that, he goes to the electric chair or whatever he goes to and they kill him. So you could feel he was trembling, like taking the food from his hand. From the, he was eating with his hands, shaking. And you could hear the, the, the um, warden, the prison guard telling him, hurry up. And he was trembling, like you could see the fear and the trembling that he was going through. You know, do you know that that's how the devil looks like? 
Because the devil knows that his days are numbered. He knows that hell has been created and there is a set time for him to be sent to the chair. So the devil trembles. Let's say the worst thing you can do to the devil is to remind him of hell. To remind him that you know that there is a set day. I'm going to be in heaven. In my father's place, there are many mansions. I'm going to be sitting in the mansions in heaven. I'm going to be eating on the table with Jesus Christ. But you know, far devil, there is a place in hell prepared for you. You're going to be burning in an internal lake of fire. Just remind the devil of his, his destination and he will begin to shake. He will begin to tremble because the devil has no power. Hallelujah. The devil has no power. So when you begin to recognize Satan for who he is, you lose any kind of concern, any kind of fear for him. You know, we've prayed for people. I'm talking about a crusade. Crazy things happen. You know, in Africa, crazy things happen. Where witch doctors will come bragging, we're going to kill you. If you don't stop this crusade, we're going to kill you. And then you see the same witch doctor will come back the next day and say that, listen, since I stepped foot on this field, none of my charms is working. None of my charms is responding to me. You know, I'm talking about, you realize that the devil has no, all he does is talk. That is why you should never be afraid when someone filled with the devil begins to threaten your life, begins to say they're going to do things to you. You should never be afraid because that is all they can do. So bad things happen to people because there is a devil that is against them. There is a devil that wants to kill them. There is a devil that wants to destroy them. But God has given you power. He says that when you resist the devil, he shall flee from you. So it doesn't matter what the devil does or the devil is doing. When you learn to resist him, he will flee from you. Somebody say amen. The second thing I want to show you here, why bad things happen to people, is that When people give in to the spirit of fear, because fear is the opposite of faith. Fear, you know, people say that the opposite of faith is doubt. No. The opposite of fear is faith. Because matter of fact, fear and faith comes the same exact way. Fear and faith is defined the same exact way. Faith is the confidence that you have in God that he will do that which his word says, that, you know, that you are sure that God is going to do and perform his word according to what he has said. That is faith. Fear is the confidence that you have that that which you have heard is going to happen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Fear comes by the things you hear. You know, for instance, if you keep listening to CNN, you are listening to CNN every day, you are going to start being afraid. Like, for instance, now they say there is something called monkeypox or whatever it's called. Like they did two um, two years ago with COVID, where people were afraid of their life. They didn't know what to do, how to live, because the news kept telling you that we are all going to die. And you come to find out that the news, you know, exaggerated a whole lot. And they realized that two years later, you are still alive. Man, you realize that with everything that you went through, if you knew, that you were going to be here today, you would have not given in to any of the things they told you to do two years ago. So the devil works, God works in faith. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone that comes to him must first believe that he is. So the devil also works in fear. The devil gets you to be afraid because fear is a spirit. First Timothy chapter, uh, first, second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says that for God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of the soundness of mind. So fear is a spirit. The devil says that, the Bible said, that do not give the devil a foothold or he will take a stop. So one of the things that the devil would use to gain access into your life is through fear. And many believers have attracted that which they fear. Just as you would attract that which you believe, you attract that which you fear. One of the most interesting stories in the Bible is the story of Job. When you read Job chapter 1, the Bible talks about, you know, let, me, let me go there, because the way you are looking at me, you think I'm lying to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's look at Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. The Bible says that there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, 
That man was blameless, upright, and one who feared God and shunned all evil. And, it, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possession were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. First of all, understand this. The Bible said that Job was a very wealthy man. His children would go and feast. And after that, because Job was concerned that they would have said something or done something against God, so Job would send for them and do a sacrifice of um, cleansing to, to sanctify them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to the, present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered, the, answered the Lord said, from going to and fro the earth. First of all, if any of your friends, you have a friend that is always going to and fro, they, there's no purpose, there is no direction to their life, they are always going to and fro. That is a very, a, the first manifestation of the devil in their life. So from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth from it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant, Job? If God boasts and brags about you, you are in a good place. Because God saw Job and told, said to them, have you considered my servant, Job, that there is not like him on the earth? I want there to be, I, I want God to look at me and say, man, have you considered my servant Kofi? There is not like him on the earth. And a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made... This is what I want you to understand. So this is what Satan said. Have you not made a hedge around him? Around his household and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. So Satan recognized that Job was protected. His household was protected. But Job was always concerned that his children would do something to curse God. So he said, he, Satan said to God, I stretch forth your hands and, and, and touch him. And God said to the devil, all that he has is yours. That just don't touch his life. And that is where many people get confused. And that is why many Christians would, 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 when they are going through trials and they are going through hard times, they would try to, you know, put themselves with Job. But God did not stretch forth his hands and touch Job. God said to the devil, everything he has, it's in your hands. And that was actually a fact. Because at that moment, Satan did not even, hadn't even recognized his place in, of dominion. Because you have to understand this, that when God created the heavens and the earth, God gave dominion to Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they, they lost all that dominion into the hands of the devil. That is why Satan said to Jesus, that bow your knees to me for all the kingdoms of this earth are mine to give away. And Jesus never told the devil that he was lying because it was true. Satan did have dominion over the earth and over everything that was in the earth. That is why when Jesus died, the Bible said he took the keys of dominion from the devil. So Satan went and stretched forth his hands and touched Job. But one thing that I want you to see here that, you know, would change your life, would help you here, is chapter 3, verse, the last verse in chapter 3. Verse 25, chapter 3. The Bible said, 
For Job said that for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. So you have to understand, because Satan said, have you not built a hedge of protection against him? And the Bible says that when the hedge is broken, the serpent will bite. So which means that at some point, for the devil to have access to Job, the hedge of protection around him must have been broken. Because everything God does is permanent. The Bible says that for the giftings of God are without repentance. God is not a man that he should lie. God will never build a hedge of protection against your life and against your family. And then tomorrow change his mind and say, you know what, I'm taking the hedge of protection out from you. There must have to be something that you would do to break or bring a crack into that hedge of protection. And because Job allowed fear to creep into his life, that hedge of protection against his life was broken. And it gave the devil access to stretch forth his hands and touch the life of Job. But listen to me. The Bibles and then other scholars, Bible scholars say that Job's whole ordeal lasted for at most 18 months and God restored unto him double for all that he has lost. I came to tell you that listen, it doesn't matter what you have been going through. Maybe the devil might have stolen things from your life, but the Bible says that if the thief may be found, he must return seven times for all that he has taken away from him. I came to declare that everything that the devil has stolen from your life, the hand of the devil shall be forced to return double for all your troubles in the name of Jesus. So, because he allowed fear to creep into his life, it gave the devil access and legal grounds to attack Job. He says that all that which I fear has come upon me. I said that fear attracts, faith attracts. When you set your faith to have something, nothing would, but nothing would say no to you. When you set your faith to walk in God's blessing, you would walk in God's blessing all the days of your life. But when you allow yourself to be afraid, you will see that your life begins to attract the very thing which you are, you are afraid of. That's why the devil works. You know, you can check in history. That is why the devil and the devil's children, the media, everything, they are the masters of fear. For the devil to force people to do anything, he has to first get them to be afraid. Man, if we're able to tell you that there is a disease called COVID-19 and it's going to wipe away about two-thirds of the whole population of the earth, you are going to give up all your right and your freedom because of the fear. But if you have no fear in you, you would say that, listen, I'm not afraid of what is coming. I'm not afraid of what the devil is doing. I know that God shall keep me safe. I know that God shall keep me healed. He said that by his stripes I am healed. He, you know, in Psalm 91, the, they that dwell in the shadows of the Almighty shall abide under the, they that dwell under the, what is, what is Psalm 91? They that abide under the shadows of the Almighty shall dwell, shall, shall dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, let me read Psalm 91. I don't know why it's, <laughs> Hallelujah. So, if you allow faith to consume your mind, you are not going to succumb to the trick crease and the fears of the enemy. Many believers have allowed themselves to be given into fear because you, you allow the news and the things out there to dominate your mind and take hold of your mind. You, are, you think you are consumed with the news, and you don't even know what the word of God says. But the Bible said in Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the most, I shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. You know, in 2020, they said that we are going to die. I, we began to, my wife, we began to pray and quote Psalm 91, that he who dwells in the secret of the Most High God shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will, I will trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous 
pestilence. Listen, it could be a monkey shadow, chim chimpanzee paws, it doesn't matter, um, um, snake, uh, whatever they want to call it. Ebola, E. coli, um, Sakola, COVID. Let me tell you this monkey pox, HIV AIDS, and COVID 19 can merge together and have a baby. I'm not going to be afraid of the arrows that fly by day. I'm not going to be afraid of the tricks of the enemy because they that dwell in the secret place of the Almighty, they shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty God. He said, He shall keep sickness and diseases away from my mix. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says that a thousand may fall on my side, ten thousand on my right hand, but it shall not come near me. No sickness shall come near me. No disease shall come near me. No allergies shall come near me. Let me tell you this. The Bible talks about in, in Exodus that there was, a, there was an angel of death who went about, who swept through the land of Egypt. And the, God gave the children of Israel an instructions to kill the lamb and mark the door, their doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And when the death angel moved and he saw the blood on the doorpost, it passed them by. And it went to the houses that do not have the blood on their door. I came to tell you, I don't have the blood of a lamb. I have the blood of Jesus. I am marked and secured by the blood of Jesus. In the spirit of destruction that shall sweep through the nations of the earth, I am exempted and you are exempted. You will not die before your time. You shall not contract any deadly disease. He said that no deadly disease shall come near you. For I am the Lord God that healed thee. The diseases that came upon the Egyptians shall not come near you in the mighty name of Jesus. I do not give in to the spirit of fear. I do not allow fear to dominate and live in my heart. I have given in to the faith of the almighty God and I'm going to speak like God speaks. I'm going to talk like God talks. I'm not going to speak like the world speaks. When all men say there is a casting down, I shall say that there is a lifting up. When all men say that the economy is bad, I shall say that I am prospering in this time. That even in famine, I shall eat in plenty. Somebody shout hallelujah. So when you give into faith, you don't speak like how the world speaks. You know, they say that there is, there is an impending famine. Right now, if you have a baby and you can't breastfeed, good luck. Because there is no baby formulas. I, you know, I walk through Walmart and the baby aisle is empty. The way they have the baby formulas. Mothers can buy food for their kids. Wicked devil. That is what the devil wants to do. The Bible said that in the days of Isaac, there was famine and God gave Isaac wisdom to dig wells. That in the midst of famine, Isaac dug wells. And when no one had water, he had water to water his cross. Isaac grew mighty. They were struggling. They were trying to figure out. They confiscated his well. He went somewhere else and dug another well. They took that well. He went somewhere else and dug another well. Listen, you can't stop whom God has blessed. Whom God has blessed, no man can curse. And I came to declare that it doesn't matter what they do. You are blessed of the Lord. I declare you blessed. You are blessed when you go out. You are blessed when you come in. The blessings of the Lord for resides upon your life. It resides on your family. It resides on your children. It resides on all that which concerns you in Jesus' name. You can curse whom God has blessed. I'm too blessed. I'm too blessed to be worried about the World Economic Forum. Who are they? Who is man to sit down and plan and determine the outcome of my life? Who is he who has said and it shall come to pass that which God has not declared? Who is he? I'm too blessed. I'm too blessed. I'm blessed. I'm untouchable. I'm too blessed. I'm blessed when I come in. Listen, I was blessed when I was in Pittsburgh. I was, I'm blessed when I came to Rockford. I was blessed when I went to Jemison. Everywhere I go, the blessings of the Lord face, chases me. Hallelujah. The Bible says that I have been young and I've been old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his children beg for bread. 
Your children shall not beg for bread in these days. You shall not beg for bread in these days. Listen, you know, when, when, people are, uh, when people lack food, there would always be plenty food on your table. If, listen, the Bible said there was famine in the land and God sent ravens to feed Elijah. The Bible we read is the, is the book of the supernatural. We serve a supernatural God. We don't serve God like the others serve God. We serve a supernatural God. Somebody say amen. amen. We serve a supernatural God. So don't allow yourself to succumb to fear. David said, I walked through the valleys of the shadows of death. I shall fear no evil. So, the Bible didn't say that you are not going to walk through the valleys of the shadows of death. But what the Bible said that the valleys of the shadows of death will not have enough power to overcome you. You would walk in the midst. You would walk in the midst of the economic hardship. You would walk in the midst of the famine. And you would not feel it. Amen. I saw, like, when the gas prices started going up. I said to myself, I'm not going to know, I'm not going to feel this. I used to put $56 in my gas, and now I'm putting $120 in my gas. And I'm telling you this, it was as easy for me as when I was putting $56, as I now I'm putting $120. It doesn't matter what they could jack up the gas prices to $10 per gallon. God would give me $10 per gallon for my gas. For he said, I shall supply all your needs according to your riches. Listen, no matter what they do, my God said, listen, God, the God that I serve, he has paved the streets with gold. He owns all the gold and the silver. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My God has not, is not limited in resources. My God is not broke. My father can take care of me. He can do exceedingly abundantly more than I can think or even imagine. I'm not going to give in to the fear of the news. I'm not going to allow their words and their, their thoughts and their sayings to consume my mind. I'm going to be giving into the word of of God. I'm going to speak the word of God. When all men say there is a casting down, I'm going to say that there is a lifting up. There is a lifting up of your head. Your business shall prosper. Your family shall prosper. You shall be blessed. You would have more money than you've ever had in the mighty name of Jesus. When everyone is going down, you shall be rising up. When everyone is crying, you shall be rejoicing. When everyone is saying we are finished, you shall say, I am just about to storm. For the Bible said, what no eye have seen, what no ear has heard, what has not yet entered into the heart of men, that is what God has prepared for those who love him and according to his will. I know there is a room full of people because you did not leave your house to come to church this Sunday evening because you hate God. There is a room full of people who love God and God has called you by his name. God has called you. So I came to tell you, Congratulations for your greatest days are not behind you, for they are ahead of you. You shall see the hand of God. You shall see the glory of God. You shall see the blessings of God. You shall see the favor of God. You shall see the hand of God move on your behalf and do that which is unthinkable and do what no man has seen and do what no man has heard. You shall eat in plenty in the days of famine. No sickness shall come near you. No sickness shall come near your family. No sickness attack your children in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout amen and give God praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. The devil, if it's left for him alone, you would, you would cry yourself to sleep. That is, that is what it is. You would cry yourself to sleep. But you are not. Because though he has plans, the Bible said in the book of Jeremiah, God said that the plans that I have towards you, said God, it's not plans to harm you, but plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future, and plans to give you hope. You have a glorious future in God. The devil has been lying to you for so long. Oh, woe is me. I'm finished. I'm dead. I'm doomed. I'm done. You know, I was, I was talking to a man. Supposedly, he's a Christian from the Greek Orthodox. And he was telling me about all the things that is going on in the world. Russia, Ukraine, the famine, the gas prices. And I kept telling him that, listen, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And he would say, oh, I know, but you, know, you don't want to get too hopeful. 
I am hopeful. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because the Bible said that I am the light of the world. God said that as long as I'm here, I am the salt of the earth and the salt is supposed to be preserved. I am called not to show forth famine. I am called not to show forth hunger. I am called not to show forth poverty, but I am called to show forth the praises of God. The world must see me and celebrate my God. Hallelujah. I am a testament of the goodness of God. I don't care the direction that this world takes. One thing I know for sure, that I know that the direction that my life is taking. For the Bible said that mark a straight path for your life. I know that I'm going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. I'm going from victory to victory. And I'm going from strength to strength. And the devil can't do anything about it. The devil can't do anything about it. Whether the devil likes it or not, I'm blessed. The devil can't do anything about it. The Bible says that Balak hired Balaam to curse the children of God. In Numbers chapter 19, chapter 21, chapter 22. And as he opened up his mouth to curse them, blessings came out of his mouth. God said to Abraham, Abraham, today I bless you. And whomever you bless shall be blessed, and whomever you curse shall be cursed. Whomever blesses you, I the Lord shall bless and whomever curses you, I, the Lord, shall curse. Yeah. Now, so I say this all the time. Man, if you bless me, uh-huh. you are doing it for your own good. <laughs> because I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm the child of the Lord Most High God. And God said that whomever blesses me, he will take it upon himself to bless them. Yeah. So when you bless me, you are making yourself a candidate for the Lord to bless you. You have to believe God's word. If you make your point to make trouble for me, you are making yourself an enemy of God. I don't have to pray about you. I don't have to do anything about it. The children of Israel, matter of fact, they didn't even know that Balaam was hired to curse them. But, you know, the Bible said that when he stood upon the mountain, and then, you know, the children of Israel, Israel, every time they stopped, they were supposed to camp. The way their camp was set, there were supposed to be a group on the north, a group on the west, a group on the east, and on the south, and then the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. So every time they camped, they, 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 every time they stopped, they camped, and they looked, looking at the area of you, they looked like a cross. And the Ark of the Covenant was in the middle. And when Balaam stood on the mountain, he said that I see him. You know, I don't want to get into that because then if I start opening up the Bible, I'm going to deviate from my, my message. But he said that I see him. So when he was brought forth to curse the children of God, he saw one person who stood among them. And then he couldn't curse them. Let them do whatever they want, you, they want to do. Let them plan whatever they want to plan. For the greater is he who lives in me than they that are of the world. I'm too loaded. I'm too loaded. I'm too blessed. Hallelujah. Whom God has blessed, no one can curse. You know, look through the Bible. Anyone that made themselves an enemy of God's people made themselves after the children, went after the children of God for their destruction. They always were destroyed in the place of the children of God. Look, Acts Acts about Pharaoh. With a pride in his heart, I'm not going to let these people go. God killed his kids. God destroyed his whole entire army. God brought that great nation down in one day. I'm telling you, you have to understand. God fights for you. The Bible says that he is my very present help in times of trouble. He is my father. And just like a natural father would do everything for the safety of their children, God would do everything for them. God would make sure, if you set your faith in God, God would make sure that you never go to bed hungry unless you decide not to eat for fasting. Hallelujah. God would make sure that the devil never has an upper hand over you. You decide, you make up your mind that I'm not going to succumb to the fears of this world. I'm not going to give in to the fears. 
Because when you allow yourself to fear, you are attracting those things to you. You know, let me, let me, let me give you these very practical things, and it will, op- it will let you understand a lot of things. How many of you remember the last time you were sick? The last time you were sick. If you remember the last time you were sick, remember this. It all started, you started thinking about being sick. Oh, I feel like I'm getting sick. Oh, I think I'm getting sick. Oh, I'm sick. I'm sick and boom, you were sick. You realize that that is how the devil works. It comes into your mind. He begins to plant those seeds into your mind. Oh, I think I'm getting sick. But when you decide on the, on the contrary to resist the devil, the devil will flee from you. When the thought comes into your mind and says, I'm not sick, for I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. When you begin to go against the grid, you realize that the devil will leave you alone. Faith is a tangible force. Faith is a substance. Faith is a reality. Faith works. And man, I'm, I'm praying that this week I'm going to preach all, I'm going to, that's the reason why I'm starting with this message, because this week I want to preach on faith. Which would, would help you a lot. Because if there's ever been a time in, in life where people need to really understand the faith of God, because the faith of God will put you above every storm of life. The faith of God says that though I see the storm rising up, Jesus said that I'm crossing over to the other side. I'm not afraid of the arrows that fly by day or the arrows that fly by noonday, for it shall not touch me, and I am secured in God. So when you allow yourself to be afraid, you fall into the tricks and the camps of the enemy. Then the enemy is able to enforce. Because they actually, the devil doesn't have to do anything to you when you are afraid. The, must, the best thing the devil can do against you is to get you afraid. Because when you are afraid, your fear will bring all those troubles to you. Your fear will bring all those troubles to you. And many of you, you are eating the fruits of your fear. Many of you, when you had a child, you were so much afraid that your children one day will not serve the Lord. They will walk away from the Lord. You, you were always concerned about that. And now that they are older and not serving the Lord, you realize that you are eating the fruit of your faith. That which you were afraid of all this while is what you are seeing. When you were younger and healthy, you were always concerned about getting sick. Oh, man, I heard when you get older, the first thing that goes is your hip. And now you are older and your hip is gone. And then they said, oh, when you get older... You have about 30 seconds to get to the bathroom. <laughs> Everything just becomes so loose when you're older. See, because you were, those thoughts were planted in your mind. But if you had known the word of God, that even in old age, you shall be strong and vital. Amen. That, listen, as your days are, so shall your strength be. So as a believer, if you know that you are not supposed to deplete in strength when you get older, then you would contend for that, and you would not allow yourself to be weakened. What did um, Caleb say? Caleb went to Joshua, and he said that, I am 85. Allow me to go and possess the mountain that was given to me by Moses. For I am as strong in my 85 as I was in my 40. Just put a sword in my hands. He was an early five-year-old man and he took up a sword and went upon the mountain and drove away the inhabitants of the land. God said to Moses, come up onto the mountain at the age of 120 years old. Just imagine a 120-year-old man climbing up a mountain. You can't do that with a walker with two tennis balls in the back. <laughs> Hallelujah. As your days are, so shall your strength be. You don't confess Weakness as you get old. I'm going to be 90 and I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be strong when I'm 120 years old. My mind will be sharp. I'm still going to be running around with my children and my great, my grandchildren, my great great grandchildren. I'm going to be throwing them up in the air and I'm going to be catching them. I'm not going to lose, I'm not going to have Alzheimer's. I'm not going to have dementia when I'm older. My mind is going to be the sharpest it's ever been. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to have more wisdom. I'm going to have more intelligence. I'm going to be strong and vital. Hallelujah. I'm going to still travel and I'm still going to be preaching. I'm not going to tone down when I'm old. I'm not going to sit on a stool. I'm still going to be walking around as an evangelist because that's what I do. I travel. Amen. Hallelujah. 
So you have to understand that. Don't allow fear. By the fruit of a man's lips shall he be satisfied. When you allow yourself to speak the words of fear, you are satisfied by those words. But when you are allowed to speak the words of faith, when you begin to declare what God's word says, I am blessed when I go in, I'm blessed when I come out. Hallelujah. I am favored. I am blessed and highly favored. God, the anointing of, you know, usually, and you know, your pastors will, maybe they would agree with me on this one. But when you are a preacher, like me, you need to work your, it's, it's, you know, it's just like the mind thing. You need to work your way into the anointing. For instance, if I'm sitting down, like I came here in the morning service, I didn't feel any anointing. If you ask me to pray for you, good luck. I don't, I don't feel anything. That's what it is. But then when you begin to preach, you begin to preach yourself into the anointing. And then when you begin to minister. So I was in a church and a preacher asked me, can you help me pray for people? I didn't feel anything. Nothing. Not even an ounce of the anointing. But all I said was that, Father... Thank you that the anointing lives in this body. The anointing is in this clothes. The anointing is in this hands. And I'm telling you this, as we were praying for people, as I touched people, people began to shake. People began to fall under the power. Because it is not done by my ability. It is done by my faith in God's word and in God. So when you have faith in God, Every fear leaves you because fear and faith cannot live in the same place. And if fear dwells in you, faith leaves. Because one, fear is the confidence. Faith is the confidence. Fear is the confidence that that which you have heard has the power and ability to manifest in your life. Faith is the confidence that the word of God would perform that which he said will perform in your life. So when you are fearful, you open up the door. You know, fear is the fate of, basically, let me tell you this. Fear is the fate of the devil. Faith in the devil's words. Faith in evil reports. And the Bible says that upon whose reports shall you believe. And I want to deal with this tonight. You know, I'm not even going to go into my third message. But I, my third point. But I want to deal with this tonight. Because many, many believers have allowed themselves to be controlled by the fears of this world. That you are so af much afraid, you are afraid of your own shadows. You are afraid of tomorrow. While the Bible says that do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own troubles. For God will take care of you. Put your trust and your faith in God. The Bible says that cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Let me tell you this. There is one thing. God cannot go, God cannot go against his word. That is why, you know, sometimes I could just picture Father God standing in heaven looking down upon his children. And God wants to be able to come and take away that issue from your body. God wants to be able to come and change your life. But because of the lack of faith to be able to pull that which God wants to give to you from, you, from him, you have given into fear. So even when God is chasing you with his blessing, you are running away from God, pursuing the negative things of the devil. Man, there is, you have to understand that we serve a good God. God, it's not difficult to receive a blessing from the Lord. And the Bible says that even you that you are wicked, when your children ask you for bread, you shall not give them stones. How much more your heavenly father, that when you ask him for the spirit, will he not give it to you? You have to understand that God is not slow to answer your prayers. But it's because of your inability to believe in him. Man, if you would switch tonight and say, God, I'm going to look upon you. I'm going to look to you for you are the author and the perfecter of my faith. That it doesn't matter what is being said around me. It doesn't matter what the news is saying. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to stand on your word. And I'm going to walk in you. I'm going to walk with you. And you're going to walk with me all the days of my life. You shall see the hand of God. Your hand of God wipe away years of sorrow. And God will give you a fresh start in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. I want you to rise up on your feet all over this place. She pando. I want if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Lepe, Lando, Leke, Palas, Kapa. Lande le kaloshe, palate le le pa. Listen to me. The Bible said, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone that comes to him must first believe that he is. Tonight, if you believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly for you, you shall see the glory of God revealed in your life. If you believe that God is able to heal you, he will heal you. you he would heal you. If you believe that God is able to give you a turnaround, God will give you a turnaround. Somebody say amen. amen. Before I do anything, I want to pray for a few, some people tonight. If you are here and you are deaf, either deaf in one year, both years, or you have hardness of hearing, I want you to lift up your hands and wave at me. Anyone, deaf, hardness of hearing, with hearing problems, quickly come to the front. You are deaf in one ear, both ears. I'm going to pray for you, and God is going to open your ears in the name of Jesus. Quickly, just stand up in the front. Michael, can you play something? I heard you're very good. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands and begin to talk to the Lord. Jesus is the one that heals you, not me. And the church, I want you to stretch forth your hands towards your, your people, your brothers and sisters, and pray for them. Pray that the Lord touches them, that the Lord gives them a miracle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, 
So he said, listen, he said he can hear better in the ear that I prayed for than the one that was okay. So now he wants the, the good one to be as good as the new one. So you see, he didn't realize that a good one was bad until the bad one became good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this. Your ears is going to... God, when, when God does heals, there is healings that takes time. So when we, were, when we block this and you could hear close, you're going to realize that it's going to keep opening up. It's going to keep opening up. Amen. So you realize that this ear is, is, it keeps getting better yeah. and better and better. You heard me snap, right? Yeah. You can hear me snap? Yeah. So he's going to keep getting better and better. And just like the man said, this ear would hear better than this ear. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Tonight is just the beginning of what God has in store for us all this week. And because we have many days together, you want to give, give it time and let God move yes. in, in, in the people's life. Yes. Um, I want you to raise up your hands to heaven and just begin to praise the Lord all over. Let me pray for you, you dear lady. Stand here. Lift up your hands. Close your eyes. And as you do, the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Fill with the fire of the Holy Ghost on the top of your head and be whole in your body. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Let me pray for you. Can I pray for your family? Can I pray for you guys? Stand in the middle aisle. Just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost wherever, all over this place. Be filled. Jesus' name. Fill. Fill. Hallelujah. She panduro koto she payara da pa. Lende le pele de pe. Come to the front. Let me pray for you. You come here. You to come. Lendo lo pudo ko she payara pa. Lift up your hands and close your eyes quickly in the name of Jesus. Fire of the Holy Ghost from the top of your head. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. She panduro ko le she palato she. Can I pray for you? Lift up your hands. Heal from the top of you to the source of you. Jesus. Can I pray for you? In the name of Jesus. Feel Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. Maski plante le palana poche, pante le le pe, le palando lo koshki pele le pe. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Listen to me. Tonight is only the beginning, and with everything with God, it gets better as the days goes by. If you are here, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you once did, but you are not living for him. Because of one, the, the troubles of this world, the cares of this world, the love of the world. Sudden attack on your family, sudden death of a loved one that has made you mad at God. God is not the one who did it, it's the devil. And you don't want to go to hell because of what the devil did against your life or against your family. Tonight... If you are here, you want to leave this place knowing that you've made things right with God. You want to go home knowing that you have peace with God. You want to go home and lay your head to the pillow knowing that there is nothing that is separating you and God. Amen. If you are here and you say, Preacher, I want to make, I want to make sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I want to make sure that I've 
there is nothing between me and the Lord. I want to make sure that my life is secured and my death eternity is secured. There is really a heaven and there is really a hell. And everyone will spend eternity on one of those places. You have to understand that if it was left for the devil alone, you will go to hell. And if it's left for God, you go to heaven. God has voted for you. The devil has voted against you. And now it is left for you to cast the deciding vote. It is completely in your hands and it's completely in your power to decide where you would want to spend eternity. And tonight, I want to ask you that are you sure, do you know without a shadow of doubt that if Jesus comes tonight, you are going to go to heaven with him? The Bible says that broad is the way that leads to life, to death, and many would find themselves on that path. The default is hell. But for you to go to heaven, you have to make a conscious decision. Narrow is the path that leads to life, and only a few would find it. Tonight, I want to help you find that narrow path. The only thing you have to do to go to hell is to do nothing. Don't put this off. The Bible says that when you hear the call of salvation, do not hark in your heart. For no one knows the day or the hour that the Lord is going to come. No one knows what is going to happen tomorrow. No one, your tomorrow is not guaranteed, but you can guarantee your one-way ticket to heaven tonight. If you are here, you say, preacher, I'm not 100% sure whether I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know for a fact. I don't know for this food. I don't know without a shadow of doubt. Make sure you know that tonight. Make sure that you remember there has to be a day and time in your life where you receive Jesus. That any time the devil comes to trick you and lie to you and tell you that you are not saved, you can remind the devil that in May 20, May, on May 22nd in um, Rock, Riverside Assemblies of God in Rockford, I made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. With every head by every eye closed, if you are here, you say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. I want to make things right with God. Oh, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. I want you to wave your hand at me, and I'm going to pray with you all over this place. Is there anybody here? I want to make sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I see your hand. Who else? Who else is here? I see your hand. Who else? Anybody here? God is dealing with your heart. God is wrestling with your heart. You know that you need to make this decision tonight and give your life to Jesus. Lift up your hands and wave at me. And I'll pray with you. I see your hand. Hallelujah. Anybody that lifted up your hands? I'm not doing this to embarrass you, but anytime God called people, he says that come out from among them and be ye separate unto me. God called Abraham out of his family. Anytime God calls out people, he calls them out of the crowd. They come out and stand in front of me, and this is your sign that you are walking out of the world and into the kingdom of God. So if you lift up your hands, I want you to come here quickly and clap for them as they come. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to come. Praise the Lord. Come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, my friend. Praise the Lord. Listen, I came here for you. Praise the Lord. I came here for you. God sent me here specifically for you. Hallelujah. I want you to lift up your hands and I want you to... Uh, wow, you're joining. Wow, praise the Lord. This is a big altar call for, for tonight. Praise the Lord. If you are there, you sit in the stands and God is still dealing with your heart, I want you to join me here tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want you to lift up your hands. Those that are in the front, lift up your hands to heaven as a sign of your surrender to Jesus. And I want you to pray this with me from the bottom of your heart. I tell you to pray this because sometimes people don't know the words to say when you, you tell them to pray. And these same words, I said these same words in 2011 and my life has never been the same. So as you repeat these words, your life will never be the same again. Amen. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. I repent of all my sins today. Forgive me. Wash me with your blood. I confess with my mouth that Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my personal Savior. I believe in my heart that Jesus, God raised you from the dead. And I believe in my heart 
that you are coming back for me. Fill me with your spirit. Strengthen me where I'm weak. Help me to live for you. And from tonight, I will live for you and I'll live for you alone. In Jesus' name. Now lift up your hands. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want to declare to you that you are as saved as I am. There is, you are on your way to heaven. If Jesus comes this very moment, you would be on your way to heaven. Amen. The arrows of the lift up your hands, let me pray for you. The arrows of the wicked will not touch you. The shield of faith that quenches every fiery dot and comes around you. I declare over your life in the name that is above every other name that you shall live a very successful life for Jesus from tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now lift up your hands, close your eyes. Be filled with the Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus, be baptized in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Be filled with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name. Fire of the Holy Ghost into your belly. In the mighty name of Jesus. Mom, in Jesus' name. Be filled in Jesus' name. Filled in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Be filled in Jesus' name. From the top of the earth, be filled in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. The land of the Kodesh, the land of the Man, it's, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great week already. Let me tell you this, Pastor. This morning, the Lord ministered to me, and He says that the years that a canker worm has eaten, the years that a swarming locust has eaten, God shall restore. God shall restore all your wasted years in ministry in the name of Jesus. God shall give you a speed in there and then towards this part of your life, God shall give you the speed to run and everything you should have done in your young age, God shall give you the strength and the ability to do. You would accomplish much. Just as Samson, that the Bible said in his death, he killed more Philistines than he did in his entire life. In this part of your life, God shall give you the grace to be able to outrun the king's chariot and you would accomplish much. This church will grow. Your ministry will grow. The hand of God and the spirit of the almighty God shall come, be come, come behind you and you shall not remember the wasted years. You shall not remember the former days for the latter days shall be greater. The latter reign shall be greater than the former reign, saith God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, be seated for a few minutes, and then I'm, I promise you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you out by 12.30 tonight. Be seated for a few minutes. At this moment, let's play the video. Play the video if you have it. Well, you don't want to supposed to play it? You don't want to supposed to play the video? Okay, go ahead. Roll the video. <laughs> 